back here at the at the low of October, the market was extremely oversold. That we were due for a rally, and and you know because of extreme negative sentiment, all those type of things. You know we were going to get this kind of reflexive rally market. Well, it's it's been one heck of a rally so far. Um, you know the markets have completely retraced. You know everything they lost over the summer. And we talked about coming into December that the markets would either consolidate or have a little bit of a correction. Right when we got through that kind of two weeks of consolidation, at the right at the beginning of December, the markets just went sideways, allowed the moving average to catch up, and then we kind of bounced off of that and it made a very nice move higher. Now we're extremely overbought on multiple metrics. Welcome to Thoughtful Money. I'm its founder and your host, Adam Taggart, welcoming you back for another weekly market recap featuring my festive friend, Lance Roberts. Uh, he's uh, can't wait for this discussion to be over so he can put his cap on and his sack and bring all sorts of holiday cheer to the investors of the world. Lance, how you doing, buddy? I'm good. I'm good. I am ready for Christmas. That is for sure. All right. Um, well, we're going to uh, we're going to see how this last weekly market recap of the year goes here. Um, folks, you can see my, my hair's still wet. Uh, you can probably hear my uh, scratchy voice. Uh, I've come down with a pretty nasty bug. Uh, so I have not prepared at all for this. I normally have my my big list in front of me. I, we're just winging this one today. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, and also just a bit of housekeeping. Um, this is going to be the last weekly market recap of the year uh, because next week, uh, Lance and his partners at, uh, at Real Investment Advisors um, are enjoying their holidays. And so we're going to let everybody uh, just spend time with their families. Um, all right, Lance. Well, look, um, uh, honestly, I haven't even seen how the markets ended this week because I've just been uh, pretty much unconscious. So uh, what happened this week? So, you know, we we talked about, um, let's, see what, let's just do this. Let's just start with our chart that we kind of share just to bring everybody up to date. You know, coming out of October, uh, we were at this this very low point um, in October here. Let me, I'll tell you what, let me uh, zoom in here just a little bit. And uh, we'll just kind of take a look at the last six months. So this is just six months of the data. But, um, it, you know, back here at the, at the low of October, the market was extremely oversold that we were due for a rally and, and, you know, because of extreme negative sentiment, all those type of things, you know, we were going to get this kind of reflexive rally market. Well, it's, it's been one heck of a rally so far. Um, you know, the markets have completely retraced, you know, everything they lost over the summer, a lot of catch up trade going into the end of the year. And, and right when we got through that kind of two weeks of consolidation at the right at the beginning of December, the markets just went sideways, allowed the moving average to catch up. And then we kind of bounced off of that. And it made a very nice move higher. Now we're extremely overbought on multiple metrics. You know, the, the relative strength index is is above seventy. Uh, we had a decent correction um, earlier this week. The market sold off. You know, one and a half percent day before yesterday. Now we've completely recovered that sell off in the last two days. But you know, that kind of you know pulled a, a little smidge of that overbought off. And again, with so many mutual fund managers, pension funds, hedge funds, et cetera, kind of behind the eight ball in terms of performance this year, there's a big need to get those assets on the books and to make sure their portfolios are balanced into the end of the year. And this is also one of the important things that occurred um, over the course of the last uh, a few weeks in particular, and something I'm actually kind of going over this weekend in the newsletter uh, on the website at realinvestmentadvice.com, which is... Uh, kind of looking at different indexes and different markets over the course of the year, you know, how they've performed. And, and when we take a look at the S&P 500, it's up about 23, 24% for the year. It'll be up over 25% for the year. Um, you know, once we add in dividends, get total return, the relative, the equal weighted index, which in, in October at these lows, RSP was basically negative for the year. And I've seen a lot of uh, very interesting analysis out yesterday, uh, the last couple of days in particular, uh, people have been tweets like, you know, people talk about this being just the Magnificent Seven rally this year, but the RSP has gone from the 52-week low to a 52-week high in just 33 days. And that's a true story. But if we take a look at, at RSP as, as a really good example of this, you know, this, this has been certainly the last month or so has been terrific. Uh, for RSP, you can see that we went from this very low point on RSP back to, to, to very high levels. 
Uh, the problem with that, though, is, is that the s and is up 25% for the year. RSP is up about 11% for the year. So it's about at half the performance. But we did see, importantly, we did see that rally broaden out, right? We saw small caps perform better. A really interesting, uh, you know, kind of measure of market speculation that I like to look at. It. And when you talk about, you know, speculative investors, et cetera, ARC, which is Kathy Wood's uh, uh, kind of disruptive technology ETF, it's it's up 57% for the year. It's actually outpacing the NASDAQ this year in terms of return. However, that 57% return all occurred from the October lows to now. So in 33 days, that in, that ETF is up 57%. Huge move. Yeah, so, look at that. Yeah, so it's been absolutely phenomenal. So we've seen this, this rally has indeed broadened out, but this is because of a couple of reasons. One, um, again, through the first 11 months, really first 10 months of the year, this rally was dominated by seven stocks, right? So, you know, most portfolios don't own just seven stocks. So if you just think about it from a rebalancing perspective, and this has to do with yields also. Bonds were down sharply earlier this year as interest rates went up in October. You know, we were up about a 5% yield on bonds at that point. So just think about this from a portfolio management standpoint. Now, most mutual funds, pension funds, hedge funds, et cetera, they have a mandate to maintain some sort of balance in their portfolio of some sort. So it's 60, 40, 80, 20, 70, 30, whatever it is. Well, rates were going up, so bond prices were going down. So they were underweight bonds. They were overweight, the big mega cap sevens, just because those have gone up so much in price. Even if I just own market weight, I own too many of them, uh, too much of them. And then all the other stocks in the index that didn't do anything this year, those were underweight relative in the portfolio in terms of weighting. So what we've seen going into the year is exactly what you would expect as all this money has to rebalance for portfolios. Bond yields have dropped sharply because there's been a big buying impetus for bonds to bring those weights up in portfolios. And of course, there's plenty of headlines around what's, what's driving that, but that's what's happening. That's where the buying is coming from. On the other side, on equities, yeah, we're seeing this broader base of equities now participate because everybody's got to buy those up to, to portfolio weight, whatever those are. So once we start getting that movement going, then of course, everybody else piles in, right? So you now see the Reddit traders, you know, back into the meme stocks. We see, you know, a lot of the small cap stocks performing. So people start chasing those. We saw options started, you know, kind of really laying in to the Russell 2000. So, you know, that really negative sentiment we had, that rebalance started the, the fire, so to speak. And I was talking about this um, during the week on the radio show. You know, it, it's it's very important to understand how markets work. And, and you know, when you have periods like in October, we have a ton of negative sentiment. Everybody's talking about, you know, the end of the markets and, and all this stuff is going to happen. It's, it's super dire. We've got Israel. It's going to be World War III. You better get out of stocks. That's a great environment to start buying. And the reason is, is that if I'm buying you know, or if I'm building a fire, right? So I, I, first thing I want to do if I build a fire is I put all my kindling on, the, you know, kind of in my, in my fire pit. And then I stack my logs on top of it. And if you want to cheat, you squirt some lighter fluid on top of that, right? So you've got everything ready to go, but you still don't have a fire, right? What you need is some catalyst to cause that, to, to that fire to start, right? So I have to strike a match and throw it on there and then I get fire out of it or, you know, I strike a flint, what, you know, Depends on how you want to start your fires, but it has to have a catalyst. So in October, we had all the we had we had basically all the ingredients we needed for a really strong rally. All we needed was some type of of, of match to start that fire, and that of course came from the Federal Reserve when they they backed off their their you know Fed rate hiking and started talking about potentially you know this idea that yields and markets had done the work for them. So the markets took that as well, we don't need to hype rates anymore. That means rate cuts are coming. So we started rallying the market and then that lit the fire and then everything else started chasing assets. So it's been a great 33 days, 35 days now as we wrap up this this, this week. But you know, sustainability of this rally is gonna be a little bit questionable once we get to January because we are so overbought. A lot of money has been put to work in more speculative areas. And so we could see, you know, after we get in, you know, the Santa Claus rallies, the last five days of the year, and the first two days of January. And once we get past that, we'll likely see, you know, a little bit of a reset in the markets to kind of ease off some of this really overbought condition. All right, great. Um, hey, do me a favor, go back to the S&P chart here. Sure. Uh, 
I just uh, I had seen your your in your top chart there. Uh, there was one of those little pink dots, and I'm just wondering if that was a sell signal. No, no, it's just it's just highlight. That's just a little highlight I used for an article I was drafting um, uh, for the for the newsletter this weekend. We're just really elevated here, but we're not on a sell signal yet. Okay, all right. So if we look at the S and P there, the chart there in the middle, <clears throat> as you just did an excellent job of summarizing. You know, we went from uh, a low point uh, in uh, near the end of October. Uh, to now new basically new highs for the year, or really all time highs, um, or we're getting close to all time highs. Very close, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we were we were kind of trending sideways there, and that's when you were talking on this this program about, you know, we you expected some sort of pullback or that it could just churn sideways for a while. Um, then the Fed came out and basically, <laughs> you know. Uh, delighted the markets by basically telling them what they wanted to hear. And, and your partner, Mike Leibowitz, and I talked about that in depth last week. But I'm curious, you know, you, you talked about, you know, ARC being up, you talked about the meme stocks going up. It seems like, you know, the Fed basically unlocked the cage on the animal spirits. And they're yeah. out and running now. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of speculation return to the market here. So my general question is kind of like, how, how healthy is, is this market run here right now? Um, and and I'll, I'll give a little bit of context to that too, which is, um, I, I've been interviewing a couple of folks this week. The interviews haven't launched yet. They'll all, all launch next week. But it's a number of folks who are beginning to tell a pretty optimistic story about the markets. Um, and uh, I just interviewed Darius Dale yesterday, who I think actually beat you, Lance, in um, having uh, you know more charts and more data at his fingertips uh, and can cram m like three hours worth of content into a one hour interview. Um, but he, like you, um, primarily looks at a three month, the, the next three months window, he looks at it on a rolling basis. Yep. Um, and all his indicators are blinking green for the next three months. Yep. Um, so he is fully allocated right now. Um, you know, his, his model is fully invested. Um, and he's, he's hundred percent out of cash at this point. So he feels like, um, you know, can't tell you what's going to happen after that, but for the next three months, you know, this, this market really looks set to run. So do you, do you agree with him or do you think that things are getting overextended here? Well, no, no, look, so you have to put things into context. So we just, uh, so on Simple Visor, uh, we actually just launched a, a new tool. We're still in the press, it's kind of in beta mode right now. And we're, we're still kind of putting some final tweaks on it. But this is, a, what this looks at is a weekly analysis. So, you know, you've got to remember two things when you're managing money is that duration or your time frame is extremely important to your outlook. Um, right now, the markets are extremely overbought on a short-term basis. And this is, you know, a variety of indicators on a daily basis are very overbought. So that suggests that you're going to get some type of, you know, relaxation, some type of pullback. You've got to work, it, 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 we talked about before, you know, we use the rubber band analogy a lot, which says, you know, hey, you stretch a rubber band, you, you get to the point, you just literally can't stretch it anymore without it breaking. And so to stretch it again, I've got to let it relax so I can stretch it. So that's that's all we're talking about on a, day, on, on a real short term basis. So, you know, once we get into January, we get a week or two, we get a three to a five percent correction somewhere in there. Um, just enough to get that really egregious overbought condition worked off. And then the market can rally again. Right. So you, you kind of get buyers and sellers rebalanced and then we can start moving prices up again. So, so we we have a daily money flow that we look at for the for the more uh, and I'll so this is our daily money flow indicator and this gives you real short term signals you get a buys and sells and and you know based on real short term you know fluctuations in the market but if you're if you're looking for longer term outlooks and I agree with Dale on this is that once you start to move into weekly analysis you start to smooth out all that short term volatility. And, you know, starting back in, uh, at the end of October, beginning of November, when we were talking about the markets were going to rally, uh, we got a really, we got a good confirmed strong buy signal. Uh, these tend to last for several months before you get the next sell signal. We're not egregiously overbought yet on a weekly basis. That's going to take a little bit more time to get there. So yeah, over the next one, two, three months, there's really nothing that suggests you know, that there's going to be some type of major correction in the markets. You know, there's there's no real evidence of a risk bias at this point to the downside that, you know, should keep you out of equities. You should be invested here. Now, I will warn you that, you know, there is a lot of speculation, a lot of speculation going on in the markets. 
the markets have broadened out, that's healthy, but people are now chasing stocks that are very vulnerable, vulnerable, I'll spit that out, to much larger corrections because they're very poor fundamental companies. And, and you know, the, the crashes that we kind of repeatedly see in these meme stocks and things like that, that's going to happen again. So when when this rally ends, those stocks like ARC, those kind of ARC ETF type stocks, and I'm not picking on the Kathy Wood, it's just her ETF. It's a very good representation of those poor quality fundamental companies that are a story stock rather than a, than a fundamental investment. Those will correct more than the S&P or a good basket of dividend yielding stocks that have, that have good quality fundamentals. So it depends on your time. Again, going back to the, the original part of this, it depends on what you're buying, what your duration is. I mean, if you're a day trader, buy the crap stocks. Those move the most. So if you're trading daily, buy the stuff that has, don't worry about fundamentals. You buy stuff that has momentum. If you're an investor wanting to grow your money safely over time, worry about the fundamentals, less about uh, the momentum. Um, some of the other uh, discussions that uh, I've had over the past week are, have been with folks who really track liquidity. And I know you and I have talked about this uh, a number of times, Lance. Um, but uh, an interview that's going to come out, um, in fact, I think it's coming out the day after this interview launches um, with Michael Howell, um, who, you know, liquidity is kind of his, his bag. Like that's what he just spends all his time looking at. Um, you know, he's like really optimistic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, he you know, maps out liquidity cycles and, and has, you know, correlations and, and, uh, you know, a zillion different charts, but basically they lead him to believe that, that net liquidity is going to continue rising. You know, it, 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 it reversed from contracting through 2022 reversed around October uh, of 2022, right when the market bottomed. It's now been rising since then. He basically sees it rising through 2025. So he's actually like, look, I, I think the economy is going to do well. And I think the markets are going to do really well, probably for the next two years. Um, and I'm, I'm emphasizing this because, you know, we have a lot of other folks in this channel who've been worried about recessions and the lag effect. And I've been beating that drum a lot myself. Um, yeah, I just think we need to be cautious, um, uh, as you always say, Lance. Right? You know, you, you you've got to just look at the what's happening versus what you think should happen. Um, and uh, you know, guys like him, uh, guys like Simon White from Bloomberg, also, um, uh, we talked a fair amount about liquidity. Yeah, and as long as that that tide of liquidity is rising, man, that's a that's a hard thing to fight if you're if you're bearish. So yeah. um, I know you have your own measures of this. You're pulling it up right now. So why don't I let you respond? No, no, it's it's absolutely right. You know, there's, you know, this is, look, this is a big conundrum, right? Because we have the leading economic index. It's been negative for 20 months in a row. It is the second longest streak of negative prints for the leading economic index on record outside of the 2008 financial crisis. Yet there's no real sign of a recession. Um, you know, we take a look at other economic indicators, you know, yield curve inversions, right, suggests that we should be having a recession, yet there's no real evidence of a recession. Um, the Atlanta Fed just uh, updated their GDP print for the fourth quarter, now 2.7%, 4.9% for the third quarter. Um, so in order to get to a, a recession, right, we've got to wipe out 2.7% of growth and get to negative growth for two quarters. So you know, you've got a lot, and it's kind of, and we talked about this before, it's kind of like, you know, a car rolling down the hill. Right now, you're in the process of rolling down the hill. You've got to get to the bottom of that hill before you get to the recession. Well, we're still in the process of going down that hill, um, and this is going to take longer to get to this kind of recessionary outcome than people think. But from the liquidity standpoint, yeah, liquidity is actually improving. And if the Fed is going to potentially reduce uh, interest rates, right? Borrowing costs by cutting the Fed rate three times next year, the market's expecting six, then that's going to certainly spur consumers to go out and start borrowing money. It, it supports the housing market because people can get a cheaper mortgage. All of a sudden, you kind of start putting a floor under the housing market. That's going to help stabilize the economy a good bit. Um, so, you know, and then you still have all this money that's coming in from a variety of different fronts, whether it's, uh, let's see if I've got a quick chart on that. Damn, I'm going the wrong direction here. Um, 
yeah, so so two things here. Let me show you this chart uh, to this point. I've got to make this a little bigger. So this is GDP versus an economic composite. So this is the economic composite of wages, rates, and inflation versus GDP. So GD, so when you measure G, when you want to talk about inflation, or if you want to talk about rates, or if you want interest rates, or if you want to talk about wages, these all are a function of economic growth, right? If I've got weak economic growth, then inflation and interest rates are going to be lower. Wages are going to come down because the reason, reason I've got weak economic growth is because I've got lower wages and people aren't spending as much in the economy. And if they're not spending as much in the economy, then there's not that much of a demand for loans. Uh, people are starting to pull back. So interest rates have to come down in order to get loans processed. And inflation's coming down because now I've got a, a, an oversupply of goods and services trying to sell to a smaller demand equation. So I have to bring prices down for that. So that's why there's a very high correlation. And you and I have had this conversation over the last couple of years. You know, people expecting that inflation is going to resurge and we're going to go back up. You know, we were going to go to 15, 20 percent inflation It's going to be the 70s again. And you and I discussed why that can never be the case because of the debt that we have in the economy now and, and the slower rates of economic growth are gonna to lead to that. So the economy is definitely slowing down. Take a look at GDP is definitely declining. Uh, not surprisingly, the, the economic composite is tracking right along with that as you expect, but importantly, we're still very, still very elevated. So in order to get to that recessionary territory, we still have to fall a, a, a pretty good ways to get back to zero, then we've got to get into negative territory to say we have a recession. So this is one of the things that's been kind of, you know, confounding people a bit is because we're not getting into that recessionary territory. If you take a look at M2 as a percentage of GDP, you know, it's still extremely elevated. It's, it's higher today than it was during the financial crisis. So we just have this, we have just, and I posted a couple of charts this morning on Twitter showing the amount of money flows into cash, bonds, and stocks. It's amazing. It's like, where's all this money coming from? Well, it's coming from the CHIPS Act. It's coming from the Inflation Reduction Act. It's still the stimulus checks that are out there. You know, there's just so much money that has been pushed into the economic system that this liquidity is still just floating out there. And now if the Fed's going to start cutting rates, which I'll admit kind of baffles me at this point, but if they're going to start cutting rates without a recession, that's just going to fuel this kind of support for the economy, which is going to keep it out of recession for longer than we think. All right. And look, you, you just mentioned you're a little bit baffled by Powell's decision. So like I said, I, I had a nice long talk with Michael last week about uh, that Fed meeting. But now that we got you, Lance, like, what did you take away from it? Well, uh, you know, my, my, you know, you know, it was interesting because in September, Right. They come out with their economic projections, et cetera. And they say, look, you know, we're not they, they basically left the meeting saying, look, we don't need to hike rates because the market, the decline in the stock market and the rise in bond yields have done our work for us. And that was really kind of the right thing to do at that point is like, hey, we'll just stop here. We'll let the markets and, and, and bond rates do their work. And then that should slow the economy down and, and get inflation under control. So, you know. If I was Jerome Powell, and I'm not the, the Fed chair, obviously, but if I was Jerome Powell in December, I would have stuck with my guns. I would have come out and said, hey, we're still worried about inflation. Uh, the reversal in the, the stock market and the bond market have brought yields down. That's potentially an, uh, That will potentially spur inflationary pressures in the economy. So we're going we're gonna to keep to our guns here. And, uh, you know, we, we may need to hike if, if the markets keep coming down, you know, going up and bond yields keep coming down. We may need to hike, you know, one or two more times here to make sure we've got inflation under control. But he didn't do that. I mean, he completely said. Boo about it. And 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 they reduced their projections on interest rates for next year down, you know, three quarters of a basis point for so three rate cuts. And the market was like, that's all I needed to hear. Yeah, because you know, I, I wrote about this. Uh, I believe it was last week, but you know, I, I wrote this article talking about Pavlov's experiment. I, I know you know I've talked about this before, but you know, for 13 years we've trained investors that when the Fed cuts rates, you buy stocks. Now, in this this is an interesting point because you know, if you look at the data and you look at the history of Fed rate cuts, you know, what you should take away from that is every time the Fed cuts rates. The stock market goes down. Why? Because they're cutting rates. Why are they cutting rates? 
is because there's a recession or some type of financial event, which is why they're cutting rates, which is why the stock market's going down because they're repricing for that recession, slower economic growth, et cetera. The problem though is, is that now for 13 years, we've been training investors that every time there's a sign of trouble, they're gonna show up, you know, Lone Ranger is gonna show up with, you know, high ho silver and they're gonna cut rates and do QE and boost stock prices. So I don't want to miss out, right? I, I need to be in there before that happens. I don't want to miss the rally in the markets. So now we've potentially pulled forward all that activity and people are just like, you know, I'm not worried about it. I know the Fed's going to bail it out. I'm just going to run stock prices up. I think the Fed's got themselves in a very tough position, um, you know, it, you know, it, by, by kind of allowing the market to now take control of the narrative they run the risk if they come out and say, okay, whoa, 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 we're going we're gonna to hype rates. I mean, you're going to cause a big problem in the market. So they can't do that because that'll hurt the banks. Um, so, you know, they now run the risk of losing a lot of credibility in terms of their inflation fight. So if inflation comes back here a bit, and it, and it will, we're going to get an uptick in inflation. Um, it's just a function of the year over year math that's going to occur at some point, we'll see inflation tick up. And then everybody's gonna go, well, what are you doing? Inflation's coming back, why aren't you hiking rates? You know, this is gonna cause a real problem for the Fed. I don't know when, but that's not, you know, this probably isn't a, a 2024 problem. It's probably a 2025, 2026 problem for the Fed. Okay. Um, and you know, there's, there's we gotta remember too, there are always elements of the story uh, in terms of the inflation fight that are not under the control of the Fed. So for example, the week we're talking here, Lance, right? Um, we've seen shipping traffic through the Suez Canal basically stop, right? Yeah, they're going around the, around the they, horn now. Right, they're going around the horn now, right? So, you know, so those ships will still get where they need to go, but that's at like a 40% increase in cost and time, right? And that's just inflationary, right? right? So, but, you know, but, but, you can't but, do anything but, about that. But, yeah, but you got to be really careful about that narrative. I, I've seen that thrown around a lot. Where those ships are going and those products that are delivering, we buy very few of. So those aren't going to be inflationary on us. Um, so, you know, again, so you got to be real. And, and that's a very small chunk of the overall economy in terms of the transactional business. So it's not the big. It, look, I, I will agree with you that it is inflationary, obviously, if I've got to pack on 40 percent more. But that's not going to feed into our economy as much as a lot of people are trying to make it out to be. It, it may be. Um... And I think it's twelve percent of world trade. So you know, not it's not not nothing, but it's it's. It, my point is, is there are factors like that that are outside of the control of the central planners, right? right. So Powell can have right. a plan, but to the extent that we have things like that happen, yeah. there's really not much he can do, right? Yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. And look, and, and that's going to happen. I mean, there's going to be something that happens next year that you know, economically changes the dynamics of things. And, you know, this is, you know, going back to our example about the fire, which is, you know, you can have all the ingredients mapped out, right? You know, everybody right now is making their predictions for next year. Market's going to go to 5,400, 5,200, whatever it is. Um, it's all bullish from here. It's a, and, and there's certainly plenty of case to be made for that. Um, I will tell you that anything that you have interviewed people on over the last year is not a threat. And the reason for that is, is that the markets have already factored it in. If, if you think housing's a threat, it's not. Markets have already factored that in. If you think it's, you know, inflation, you know, that's not going to be the trigger. It's already factored into the markets. Markets are aware of all these things. What gets, and, and that's the important part, right? Because markets are all about sentiment. So as long as the markets are aware of something, that's not the issue you have to worry about. It, as is always the case, and I'm going to give you a really good example of this, um, but as always the case, it's an unexpected event that nobody knows. And, and, the, and, the, re, and the reaction to that unexpected exogenous event is, I don't know what this is. I don't know what it means. I've got to sell now and figure it out first, and then I'll come back. But I've got to protect my capital. So you have this big revulsion of selling all at once as the markets try to process this unexpected exogenous event. Good example, 2018, the Fed's hiking interest rates. And in September, they said, we're nowhere near the neutral rate. And the market sells off 20% into December. President Trump comes out. We're all talking about how he's going to fire Jerome Powell because he's, in, you know, he's hurting the economy by keeping these interest rates too high. And then December, Jerome Powell pivots and is like, okay, we're done. 
We're, we're at the new, magically overnight <laughs> two months, we're at the neutral rate, everything's wonderful. And so the markets take off running. Then in June, right, everything's fine. The economy's fine, everything's fine. We're rolling along, the world's wonderful. And all of a sudden, kind of out of the blue, the Fed cuts rates. And they cut rates about three times, no, no big deal. Um, but then in September, I'm writing an article about the National Federation of Independent Business. And I'm looking at all these indicators from the small business segment of the economy that are just ringing recession alarm bells across the board. I mean, and, and, and again, there's really nothing out there that's going on. There's nothing that people are pointing to to any major degree that's a problem. But we have all these recessionary indicators that are triggering off saying, hey, we're going to have a recession. Of course, that was a very unpopular opinion at that point because there was nothing wrong. But yet in the background in September, starting in September, the Fed starts doing this massive repo operation. And nobody can figure out why we're doing this massive repo. And we can't figure out why overnight loans are now going to 8 9 10%. For, for AAA collateral. But we find out later now, months down the road, we found out it was Citadel that was having problems and others, but all this operation was going on in the background. So here's the point. People will now tell you that nobody could have seen the pandemic coming and that caused the recession. You know, had it not been for the pandemic, we wouldn't have had a recession. The problem with that story is, is that all of the kindling and everything was in place for a recession we just didn't have the, the catalyst. We didn't have the trigger. And that trigger was basically the pandemic when it showed up. And all of a sudden, it just all kind of compiled into this one point. But all the ending, all the signs were there for a recession, but you had to have that event. And so, you know, as we go into 2024, you know, everybody's now kind of rolled up. There's going to be no recession next year. It's going to be a soft landing. I'd be a little careful with that narrative because we have all of the underlying indicators for a recession, we just don't have the trigger. And that trigger may not, may or may not come. We may not have some exogenous event that pushes the economy off into a recession, but have the economic underneath the surface to allow it to happen if it occurs. So, you know, you've got to, to maintain some bit of risk control and, and some bit of bias towards understanding there is risk out there while you're long stocks. And that's a very tricky thing to do for people because I've got to be long and bullish right now because stocks are going up. But at the same time I'm doing that, we're watching very carefully for that, that change of sentiment, change of attitude, change you know, caused by some exogenous catalyst that we're not aware of that trips this market up literally overnight. And you have a, a fairly big downdraft. All right, so great. You're taking it right where I wanted to take this. Can you talk a little bit more about your current process at RIA uh, in terms of how you're entering the new year managing money. Um, you know, my recollection from the many of these weekly market recaps we've done over the year, Lance, is that uh, you have been kind of increasingly, um, you know, becoming more and more deployed. Yeah. Um, and, in September. Uh, yeah. Pardon me? In September, yes. Yes, in September. Um, and, and now, you know, it looks like, uh, you know, the, the lights are flashing green, at least for the next couple of months. Um, so you want to participate in that. Um, but you just talked about, you, you've got some concerns about the kindling that we have here. And so you don't want to be caught by surprise if indeed there is some sort of exogenous event that, that proves to be some catalyst. So how, how are you, how are you navigating that right now in terms of your allocation decisions? Well, so, you know, right now we're almost fully allocated. We're still, we, we did some tax law selling in late November. So we've got a little bit of cash on our books right now, but this market hasn't really given us a good opportunity to deploy that cash. It hasn't made any difference. Our performance has been basically tracking the index, which it's supposed to do anyway. So, um, you know, we're able to sit on a little bit of extra cash because the, the portfolio is doing its own job right now. And that's been very thankful to the drop in yields and bonds. They've been, they've been really helping support the, the portfolio return uh, since October. Um, but look, no, once we get into the new year, if we get a little bit of a pullback, kind of work off some of this overbought condition, which we will, markets don't go straight up, they don't go straight down, there will be a point that markets will give you a pullback, and we'll deploy the rest of our cash. And until we start seeing indicators that suggest that there is a, a bigger risk, then we're probably going to stay pretty fully allocated until we start to see that. Again, 
I agree with Darius. You know, you can't really predict anything out more than about a month. I, you know, three months is, is too long for me. I kind of look at things, you know, kind of one month at a time. Um, but over the next month, other than us being extremely overbought, there's nothing out there that suggests you're going to have a, a, a real big drawdown in the market. And that's the problem with big macro views. Even talking about recession, you know, the risk of, of using a macro view of, a, of an oncoming recession as a means to manage your portfolio is very flawed because you can't time that event. It's, it's subject to too many different variables that you have no control over. So using macro views to drive portfolio allocations is always going to leave you either too exposed or underexposed relative to the market. So, you know, focus on what the market's doing. The price of the market tells you everything you need to know. The trend of the market tells you everything you need to know. The market has been bullish since October of 2022. So we've been bullish for 15 months. It's, it's, it's been a very nice market. Um, but you know, that it's not going to always stay that way. We're going to have another, you know, like this summer, we had a 10% correction. We're going to have another one of those at some point uh, next year, most likely. And that'll be a, a time that we have to reevaluate things. Is this 10% correction just a correction? Or is it something more? Is, is something going on that's now really starting to impact the economy as something happened? Are we seeing a real big drawdown in, in wage growth or something like that? Um, and then we can start to decipher if this is just a correction or if this is the start of the next, you know, kind of bear market. But again, you have to just wait for those periods to arrive to make that evaluation. Trying to forecast those is very problematic. So what would your counsel be to people who perhaps sort of didn't take your advice and they were too uncomfortable with um, concerns of recession and, you know, I mean, there were plenty of times last year where it looked like, oh, okay, you know, we're all getting nervous again. You know, October was a great <laughs> example of that. Yeah. Um, and they moved to cash and, you know, UST bills were, were and are, you know, it's still really attractive place to sit in safety, right? So let's say somebody really just loaded up on, on T-bills um, and we're thinking, okay, I'm going to wait until there is a big market correction before I, I start deploying my my uh, my cash hoard here. Um, if they're starting to think, oh my goodness, you know, those recessionary odds are maybe looking lower than they were, and I just don't want to be sitting here in cash forever. Um, what would your counsel to them be right now? Well, you know, this kind of goes back to our discussion about bonds early you know, at the beginning of 2023. Uh, you and I were talking about this. Is you know, in 2022. Um, you know, people were, you know, putting all their money into cash and, and, and we were talking about, you know, short term T-bills, et cetera. And the yield, you get 5% yield in a short term T-bill. I said, the mistake that people are going to make is they're going to lock themselves up in this, in this fixed asset for this 5% yield. And then markets are going to take off and they're going to go, oh, crap, now I got to sell this to go buy that. And now you're late to the game. And this is always the problem with investing. You know, the, the biggest risk to investors is psychology. and you know, over time, this is why investors, because of psychology, always buy high and, and, and sell low versus what they should be doing. Um, you know, the problem with cash going forward is that if the Fed is going to start cutting rates, yields on money markets are going to go down. Prices of stocks are going to go up. Um, at the same time, if the Fed starts cutting rates, yields are going to go lower on bonds, which is fine if you've locked in a 5% yield on a 20-year duration. That's fine. Right. So now you've got your bond and it's kicking off 5% a year. And if you're good with that for the next 20 years, awesome. But those yields are going to come down. So if you own a, a short term, you know, six month, one year CD, T bill, whatever it is, when that matures, your option is a near zero T bill or the stock market. Uh, so you've now left yourself in an overbought market with no yield on bonds uh, at right. the very short end of the curve. And this is where be, and I'm, I'm being a little bit exaggerating here, but you get my point, which is you, you're potentially going to put yourself in a position where you're forced between two evils. And that's not a great place to be. And this is why it's always very important to navigate the risk of the market without, and we've talked about so many times about not making one-sided bets. It's okay to have a portion of your portfolio in cash at 5% or T-bills at 5%. Nothing wrong with that. Absolutely great. But don't put all your money in that because once you do that, yeah, you've saved yourself the, the emotional stress of potentially a market downturn. But now you've also potentially missed the opportunity to buy stocks when they were cheaper that give you a much better return. 
And, you know, this year, if you, you know, as a good example, 5% on, on T-bills, 11% on the equal weighted index, 25% on the S&P, 53 on the NASDAQ, where were you better to have your money, right? That this is always the challenge that we get ourselves into. And this is why balance is important. This is why clarity is important. This is why, you know, analyzing the data for what it is rather than what you want it to be is very important. And, 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 and we've talked about this bell curve of outcomes. Be very careful if you're sitting on those, those very tail ends of that bell curve, those 2% probabilities of something occurring. That's a very tough place to be managing your money. You need to be in that middle bell curve where about 90% of all your outcomes are going to occur. If somebody were to reach out to you and say, um, hey, uh, I need some help. I'm totally sitting out there on the edge of the curve, uh, all in cash. Um, just describe how you would help them think through how to deploy it. Um, you know, Would you say, okay, great. We think you should just take all your money and boom, go right in the center of the curve right now. I don't think that's the answer. But yeah, we, how we would you help every, them think we, through this? We have to, see, we have to retrain their thinking. So we put everything into ARC first. Yeah. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> so, you know, it, look, it, it's it's a hand-holding, you know, you know, I love the way I've, I've been with, with other financial firms in my life. I've built several. And I, I, the one thing I really love about RA Advisors, where we are now, is that I just get to do this, right? I just manage the portfolio and, and do this. Unfortunately, Danny, Richard, John, Jonathan, uh, the, you know, all of our CFPs, which are they are just fantastic individuals. They get the they get the really tough job. They've got to do all the hand holding, and you know they're the ones that are on the phone with you, you know, once a month, once a week, however often you need it, saying, "Hey, it's going to be okay. Don't worry about it. We got this under control. We're paying attention to this. Don't worry about that." Um, because it is, it's a re-education process. Uh, you know, a lot of people that you know, come in, they've been watching, you know, people on YouTube or the media or somewhere that's talking about the end of the world coming and they've got themselves so wrapped up in this very negative bias that it's hard to get out of that. It, it's it's a very tough to, to get out of that very negative environment. And because because the, the negative environment is very comforting because there's a lot of fundamental data to back that up, right? It's really easy to point to, oh, the housing market, and, and the recessionary indicators and this indicator and that indicator, I know I'm right because all this data historically suggests that this is gonna be the outcome and I know I'm gonna be right. And you may be eventually, right? But the problem is, is always the timing. And so one of our big challenges is, is if we've got to get you out of that warm Snuggie that you're in that's not helping you and, and move you back into being a little bit uncomfortable a little bit at a time. And we've got to get you acclimated to being uncomfortable. And the reason you want to be uncomfortable is because investing is not easy. It's hard. You know, you've got, we were buying in September and October in our portfolio when the markets were going down. And everybody's like, why are you buying stuff that's going down in price? Because it's going to turn, right? You've got to buy stuff when you don't want to buy it. you got to sell stuff when you don't want to sell it, right? This is why, we do everything backwards. So we've got to move you from that period of being really uncomfortable, being really comfortable and snug and get you into a very uncomfortable place and then get you used to being uncomfortable over long periods of time. And that takes a lot of work. Hmm. What would your um, <laughs> what would your response to this question be? I hear a lot from people, I don't really know what's going to happen, but I'm I I've got this sort of sense of. I don't want to say certainty, but but you know, get these very valid concerns, and um, you know, I can live with it if I if I stay in cash too long, I can live with that. Yeah, I'm giving up upside, but at least I I'm not putting my you know future at at undue risk, right? Whereas if I go stretch, and then the market event that I'm fearful of happens, man, I'm going to kick myself for having been safe and then, you know, moving at the exact wrong time. How do you help right. manage that fear? That's, that's the, you know, look, uh, that's the hardest one because, you know, we say we're okay with this stuff, right? Oh, I, I, you know, I can't tell you how many times in, you know, 2022 is an example. Uh, it's, and this is, we have this client fight all the time. In 2022, clients are like, hey, if I can just get 4%, if I can just make 4% of my money, I'm so happy. I'll be just thrilled if I can make 4%. That same client in 2023 was going, why aren't we beating Benchmark? Benchmark's up 25% this year. Why aren't we making 25%? Well, 
right? We always want what we can't have. That's the psychology. This is why, again, you know, the, 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 the worst enemy of any investor is the investor himself. Because we want everything that we think we want, but, you know, we're not willing to, to pay the price for wanting that. And, you know, yes, it sounds great. And, and, this, and this is why we have people, we have people today coming to us now. This is, you know, 2023. We saw people showing up that have been out of the market since 2009. Because they were like, I just, you know, I, I think this market's going to crash. It's all funny money. It's all leverage. It's all debt. It's all going to just cut. We're going to have another great depression. And 13 years later, they're like, I give up. I, I got to get some money working because I got to retire soon. Right. Um, and look, I'm not, look, don't get me wrong. I'm not sitting here saying you should buy and hold an index fund. That's probably not going to work out for you either. But, you know, when and, and that's really no different, though than buying cash and sitting on cash. Let me, you know, and, and let me put this into finer terms to help you understand this. You know, if you had money invested in the financial market in 2007, right? I just did this analysis for uh, Fox Business earlier this week because we were talking about, you know, how much money has gone into the economy. But if you had money invested in the S&P 500 index in 2007, that index, including the 50% drawdown in 2008, had you just wrote it through, you would be up 232% today on your money. So your, your $100,000 investment would be worth 232% more today, having even gone through the drawdown, right? Having gone through that miserable, terrible period of a 50% drawdown, you would still be much better off today then having avoided that whole crash, say you were a genius and you got out January 1st of 2008 and went to cash, you would be in a worse position today because you missed that whole rally, that 400% rally from the 2009 lows to now. And so it's important to try to avoid those downturns to some degree. And that's what we do. That's our job. Um, you know, in, in 2020, when the markets were down 35, we were down like eight. Um, in 2020, when the market was down 20 for the year, we were down eight, nine. Our job's not to mitigate all of the downside risk. There's no way to do that. You're going to take on some downside risk. The job is to try to reduce that downside risk as much as possible so you can participate in the markets when they're rising over the long term. That's the hard challenge, right? That's the hard part of my job. That's the hard part of your job as an investor is understanding that if you're going to invest, you have to accept the risk of having a downturn, but understand that assets are going to grow over time because of economic growth, inflation, those type of things. Those that's going to pair for you over time. But you've got to avoid. Yes, I agree. You absolutely have to avoid those big fifty percent drawdowns, so you don't make a stupid mistake of selling out at the bottom and not getting back in the market. That's where the damage occurs. Right, and, and you know, I kind of take from everything you're saying there. And this has always sort of been my advice on this channel is, you know. That's why you want to work with a good professional financial advisor who has good risk management tools, right? So that you can play in the game, you can play in the market. Um, but if things start going against you, you know, there are defensive mechanisms in place that, yes, to your point, yeah, you, the market goes down 25%, your portfolio is going to go down that year. You're hopefully just not going to go down nearly as much right. as the market has. Right. right. All right. Um, well, look, uh, uh, let's wrap up the, um, let's wrap, wrap up the financial talk and then, then let's get to, uh, you know, some of our, not, not a rant, but some of our more, uh, human element, uh, topics and then wrap this up, um, before I totally slip back into a, a coma here with this cold, um, trades, what trades, if any, have you made over the past week? Uh, none. Um, I, I no, I, I lied. Sorry. Wait, I, I said none. We actually did one. Um, Oil prices have gotten pretty oversold. And, you know, back, um, I don't have my chart in front of me, but it was probably a couple of months ago, oil prices were running up. People were, oh, yeah, I know exactly when it was. It was October. Uh, oil prices were running up uh, very sharply on this whole, you know, invasion of Israel and, and into the Gaza Strip. And everybody's talking about oil prices going to 150. And we said, hey, markets, oil prices are way overbought here. We're going to be due for a correction. So, 
you know, we need to have a, you know, I, we reduce our energy exposure at that time to expect a bit of a correction. Well, oil prices have now gotten decently oversold. And earlier this week, we, we were, 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 were uh, long Exxon Mobil, um, but we also added a position in Diamondback, which uh, is, is a driller. And drillers have a much higher correlation to the price of oil than kind of the major refiners like Exxon Mobil. So um, we did add a position, just a trading position for oil prices is kind of a play on oil prices, but we think that we're going to get a reflex of a decent reflexive rally in oil prices and and that should you know play out well and then we'll probably trade that stock off probably in january okay and now that we're here at the end of the year what kind of year has it been for ria how would you how would you summarize both your guys's performance this year and and you know how happy are you guys with how you navigated this year um this has been a really tough year um you know it's it's been one of the more challenging years on on record, and it, unfortunately, it's kind of been this way for the last couple of years, uh, because of the fact that this market was just driven by seven stocks. So if you know, I own most of those seven stocks. We own like five of them, um, and if we had our entire portfolio in that, we would be doing fantastic. So I'd be sitting there, you know, ringing the bell. Uh, we're up about six percent for the year. Um, you know, and, and, you know, the other drag on the portfolio, of course, was bonds this year because of we, we're, we run a 60-40 allocation. So, you know, that's been kind of a weight uh, on portfolios. You know, our, we've been talking for a while that, you know, we're expecting this reversion in yields and, and yields should go lower. So if, you know, the way we're positioned as we're, we're fundamental investors, um, we buy companies with strong fundamentals, um, we buy bonds because we believe in long-term benefits of the non-correlation of bonds relative stocks providing asset protection. This has not been one of the years where that strategy plays well. Um, but this is always, you know, kind of the challenge. And this is a mistake that investors make often is, you know, they look at what the market did. They look at what their portfolio did. And they're like, okay, well, I'm going to do something different because, you know, now I'm going to jump out of all of this. I'm going to get into this because that's what performed well last year. And that's generally not what occurs. You generally get a reversion of whatever sucked last year tends to be a good performer this year. Um, you know, that's just the way markets work. So, you know, our strategy was not in favor this year because bonds were under, uh, underperforming because of concerns over inflation. And even though that, you know, our thesis is that inflation is going to fall back towards levels and the economy will slow down and yields will play, it just took longer for that to occur than we thought it would. Um, the other side was is a, is this very narrowly defined market uh, that we have right now between you know the top seven and the rest of the market. Right. Hopefully that will broad if that broadens out next year, then our portfolio our portfolio performance will do a whole lot better. And the way things are looking right now, if we kind of continue this in the next year, um, we should do really well. All right. And actually, speaking of bonds, you know, were you happy with Powell's? You know, most recent uh, press conference there. Like, is he helping you out there? Oh from yeah, the bonds perspective. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I you know, I'd go kiss him right now for, uh, <laughs> you know, for for that comment. I, I think it's the wrong decision, right? I, I think it's a terrible decision that he's making. But just from a purely portfolio performance standpoint, hoo ha! Great, thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, look. In in starting to uh, to wrap up here, um, I. I introduced you as uh, I think the adjective for this week and your introduction was festive. Um, I see you wrote a, a nice little holiday uh, article on real investment advice. Um, we sort of talk about, you know, the key things to keep in mind during the holiday season. I thought I'd give you a, just a second if you wanted to, to, to share any of your, your key messages from that. Yeah, no, I, you know, I, it, this is a, a year that this is the time of year that always bothers me. I think the most, and um, I have an annual, um, expungement that I do. So anybody that emails me happy holidays, I email them back and say, never email me again. Right. And these are mostly vendors and everybody else because, you know, this is not happy holidays. This how is, do you have any friends? Yeah. And you know what though? It, it's amazing how much outreach I get on this, this, you know, these, these time of years, but you know, the important thing is, is that, you know, it's not deemed politically. And then I wrote that there's, if you want to read this post, it's, it's on our website now. And it's our wish to you um, from our advisors, from me. Um, but, you know, I, I wrote this piece 
because of, you know, kind of where we are in society today. You know, we talk about all these problems that we have and, and there's, you know, we've got this huge division between left and right. We've, we've got huge division between family members. Uh, you know, I, I can't tell you how many people I talk to is like, yeah, my daughter doesn't talk to me anymore because, you know, she supports Biden and I support Trump, you know, whatever. And right. And they don't even talk within their own family anymore because we've allowed politics and this whole political movement to drive a wedge between all of us. And we're so afraid to, to talk to one another anymore because we're afraid we're going to hurt somebody's feelings. Right. And, and so when I was writing this post, I, I'll just read to you just, uh, you know, a, a, a snippet. It says, while it may be deemed to be politically incorrect these days to say such things, the meaning and spirit of Christmas should not be dismissed. Wishing somebody Merry Christmas is not just the acknowledgement of the Christian belief in the birth of Christ, but what has been lost in the political crossfire is the sharing of love, joy, happiness, and the embracing of our fellow man, regardless of faith, race, or political leanings. And, you know, that's really kind of the, the fact, you know, just wishing somebody Merry Christmas isn't, you're not trying to make some political movement or political statement or degrade them or whatever it is. Or convert them. <laughs> or convert them, right? It's just a message of sharing joy and happiness. And God knows we need a whole lot of that in today's society. And, and, and I, I kind of go into, you know, finding joy, you know, where it matters. You know, joy of Christmas is found in reconciliation, you know, solving those. Fra this is the time of year to say, you know what, I'm sorry. Even whether you, <laughs> you believe it or not, you know, try to heal some of those friendships and some of those relationships um, you know, through the joy of Christmas, you know, it's found in rejoicing, it's found in generosity, you know, it's found in hope. And, you know, this is, you know, one of the things that will make you a better investor. If you want to be a better investor, you've got to be optimistic. You've got to be hopeful. Because if you're pessimistic, you're never going to make the right decisions with your money. And it's always going to keep you in a place where you don't generate returns because you're, you have a pessimistic view on how markets work. And, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. There are times to be pessimistic, but if you're perennially pessimistic and you allow that optimism to be shoved into a closet, it's gonna lower your rate of returns over time. And this is why if you ever meet a businessman that's successful, they're always optimistic. It doesn't matter what's going on. They're like, yep, yeah, but next year is gonna be great, <laughs> right? It's a, <laughs> you know, I filed for bankruptcy this year, but next year is gonna be awesome. Just wait, they're always optimistic. And that's why you have to find in Christmas, in the Christmas joy, you always have to find hope and, you know, and find that meaning of Christmas. And, and, and you know, so this is why, you know, we wish you a Merry Christmas. We, we you know, I, I can't tell you how I'm appreciative of all the emails you've sent me, you know, the fact that you're here every week to watch this conversation between me and Adam, you know, two dummies in the world, but I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you enjoy these things. And, you know, I want to wish you personally that you, your family, your loved ones are blessed with health and your hearts are filled with love and your spirit is overflowing with the hope um, and your and your voices rejoice in the spirit of Christmas. That's my wish to you. And, and I wish you a very Merry Christmas and a very prosperous New Year. All right. Well, well said. Um, I, something you just said there, and you mentioned this a bit earlier, too. Um, so being optimistic is a requirement for being a successful investor. Um, you've said many times in this program, market goes up, what, 85% of the time? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. Like, <clears throat> I'm going to give an analogy here, and then I'll, I'll, I'll make it hopefully make sense. Um, you and I talk a lot about fitness and health. Um, and I, I think you've seen some of those posts I've written in the past about the, the science for getting into shape, right? And and I wrote those because I went through that journey myself and I've yeah. got the before photo and the after photo, right? And, you know, in my 30s, I was I was definitely pretty hefty, right? And, um, and the reason why was because, I mean, I've always been athletic to a certain extent, but um, I just said, look, I've got to support my family. And if I've got a marginal hour, better I use that to buckle down with work than go, you know, do something selfish like work on my health, right? Go to the gym. And I began realizing it at some point, you know, when I taken a hard look in the mirror, I can't remember, maybe I went to get a physical and, and got some numbers that, that, you know, were going in the wrong direction. 
you know, it really began to dawn on me that like, well, no, no, wait a minute. If I'm not around to provide for my family, uh, then that's worse, right? Like if I end up dying early of something because I'm not taking care of my health, I'm actually failing as a provider for my family. So it, it, that let me make the mental shift to prioritize fitness and health and to see it as an altruistic investment of my time versus a selfish one, right? And I think what happens is, is a lot of people, and I've been guilty of this in my life as well, is I'm a provider for my family financially. And so I've, I've, I've created the wealth I have. I do not want to lose it. And therefore, you know, I'm, I'm being very conservative around it. And to your point of like, you know, if you want to grow it, you really got to get a little uncomfortable and you've got to put it to work. And yes, you're going to lose money at times, but, but hopefully if it's invested well, you're going to make money more than you lose money. And over time, that's going to grow. And then you're going to be able to take care of your family. So you can actually, your, your provider instinct, I guess is what I'm saying, can sometimes work against you. It can keep you from being too conservative. And you may actually, it may be putting you on a, a track to fail for your provider goals, even though the the instinct is a noble one where you, you just, you, you know, you're, you're, trying to, you're trying to safeguard what you have. But if you're too safe about it, it can actually work against you. Right. That's right. You know, we talk about, um, you know, being successful and, and, you know, we talk about capitalism and, you know, the only thing that separates somebody who succeeds at capitalism versus somebody who doesn't is the person that says, I'm willing to take that risk to lose everything to do this. And, you know, there's so many of these stories. It's like, you know, I, I, I that are out there, even, you know, you know, you read these stories about people. It's like, oh, you know, I, you know, I bet I quit my job. And I committed to do this. And, you know, five years later, we're wildly successful with whatever business it is. But, you know, it's, it's, and then there's a lot of people that go, I wish I could be like that person and be successful and have this opportunity. The only thing that separates the person that's wishing to be that way versus the person that has, has done it is taking that risk to doing it, being uncomfortable. And, you know, getting uncomfortable is, like I said earlier, it's, it's the most difficult thing to do. But it's the one requirement re that you have to have for success. Yeah, um, it is a requirement for success. There are some other ones in there. I was just talking to actually Jim Rogers last night, and uh, you know, I've been asking this question in, in uh, recently in my interviews, um, right at the very end, about hey, what's a what's a non money related investment that you would encourage people to adopt in their lives? And his was perseverance or grit, right? And that's another big one, right? It's it's it's. Yeah. Um, you can't quit. You can't quit. You, you, it's not how many times you get knocked down. It's how many times you get back up, right? Because you're inevitably going to get knocked down. Um, so there's a guy that I actually would love to interview at some point. Um, and I'm blanking on his name, but he's written the book Atomic Habits. Um, and atomic, it means he, he's using that as like trying to break it down to its simplest, most base form. And uh, he basically just says, look, it's 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 all about just just doing something right like just if you're starting from zero like even just the most minuscule step forward is progress right and uh you know he basically says you know everything uh you you pretty much break achieving a goal is basically repetitions times time mm -hmm. right and you can achieve that goal um by doing a few repetitions over a long period of time, or you can do a lot of repetitions over a short period of time, right? You, it's sort of, that's all in your control, but it's about getting those repetitions. It's about taking those steps, doing that work. So, all right, well, look, um, as we, uh, as we start to wrap things up here, um, you know, it's, uh, it's been a hell of a week. <laughs> it's been a hell of a year. Um, uh, and just to remind folks, if they didn't know, um, so my mother had passed away six months ago. My father just passed away this past weekend. Um, his was a bit of a surprise because he was pretty healthy. I mean, he was 89. So, you know, we knew that he wasn't going to live forever, but he was pretty healthy. And then he got a, he and my stepmother got a, a respiratory uh, virus and, uh, and she ended up recovering, but he just kind of kept getting worse. And, and then it, it just spiraled out of control. So very sad. Um, but, uh, you know, we're doing fine. And first off, thanks to everybody who's been sending me so many wonderful, kind wishes. It, it really is the outpouring of support. It's just been mind blowing. So thank you. But, um, Lance, here's, here's, uh, here's something that's, I've been reflecting on a lot. Um, uh, we, we just, we're finishing up his obituary right now. And, um, uh, 
there's this idea that I've had for a long time. I'd love to get your thoughts on it. <laughs> um, I went to a, a memorial service for um, some family friends years ago, an uh, older gentleman. And uh, he was a nice guy, but he was he was like a little much. Like, you know, when he came up to you at a cocktail party, you know, yeah. you could see him coming. You'd be like, all right, you know, how, how can I get out of this conversation, you know, uh, as quickly as possible? Um, he just was a little kind of, just a little too intense. Um, his heart was in the right place, but um, he could just be a little overbearing. And uh, and I think to a certain extent, you know, he he kind of picked up on that, right? Nice guy, but but you know, again, a little little overbearing. So, anyways, his memorial service was just phenomenal. Um, everybody who spoke picked the absolute best parts of him, which were true. Uh, and really honored him well for for all his strengths, and uh, you know I was thinking, God, if, I, if my memorial service people say half as many nice things about me, I'll consider it a total home run. Um, but what really struck me is I was like, you know what? Like, I'm pretty sure this guy again kind, kind of knew that folks thought that he was a little much, um, and he would have loved to have heard the things that were said about him at his memorial service. Like it would have meant so much to him to realize that people actually really valued him, you know, in that way. Cause I'm not sure he got that kind of affirmation when he was alive. And so it's always made me wonder like, why do we wait until someone's passed away to say all those things, right? And so the idea that I've, I've had is, you know, why don't we have like a, like a life milestone, right? Where, you know, maybe we all, each one of us gets one of these in life. Right. And maybe you pick the year you want it to be, or maybe it's like it's when you turn 60 or whatever. Right. Where it's kind of like a living memorial. It's like, a, you know, it's like an honor party. Right. Yeah. Where everybody in your life shows up and they kind of give you your, you know, your, your all the, they, they share with you all the things that they, you know, love and respect and enjoy about you. And you get to hear it and reflect it back to them and thank them for it. Um, I don't know why we don't do that. I, I don't either. There's a comp there's an interesting company here in Houston that um, you can hire and they go do a he's really good at it, but he does an autobiography. He does a, a biography of your parents. And so he sits down with them for hours and uh, asks them questions about their life. And he's really good at dragging out those stories and, you know, putting it all into video. So it's like, you know, kind of watch like a 60 minute special of your mom or your dad tell all those stories, but, you know, we need, you know, I agree with you. I, I think, you know, you, you need to have that moment. We don't, we just don't do it enough where, you know, I didn't do it with my dad. My dad had tons of stories. Uh, you know, he's a professional tennis player and he did all these really cool things in his life. And, you know, he would tell me little stories here and there along the way. So, I mean, I knew them. Um, and, but, you know, I never got the whole story. I'm, I'm sure there's probably a lot of other stuff. My grandmother is a good example. You know, she uh, grew up during the depression. She was born on November the 11th, 1911. She was born on Armistice Day. Um, but she grew up, um, her first husband was knocked off an oil derrick in West Texas and killed. Ooh. And then she, you know, she had to, then she went to work for Henry Post as, you know, at, at, at the Post newspaper here in Houston. And in fact, she has, uh, my mom has her roll top desk that belonged to Henry Post that he used to write the payroll checks on. And, and so she's got all this really great history, but, you know, it's going to be lost. You know, once I go, you know, that's going to pretty much most of that history is going to be lost. And we lose all this great history of our parents and our grandparents and the stories, which really make and define us as individuals. And it's, and, you know, and unfortunately now today we're trying to rewrite so much of history for political reasons that we're losing touch with, you know, kind of where we came from. And is always the case. It's, you know, that, that past, that history is what defines us. It's what makes us who we are. And it, it's, a, and I agree with you. It's a shame that we're losing that because we don't share it. Yeah. Um, I think we kind of got two different topics here. And I think both are really important, which is, um, you know, trying to pass along wisdom and knowledge from one generation to the next um, and what's great is there there are more tools now than we've ever had before. So like I've I'm pretty into genealogy, and uh, so you know tools like Ancestry.com. It's pretty amazing what you can capture there. And what's great is is every family has the story of like oh yeah Uncle Jimmy was the guy that really you know put the family tree together, but but it got lost in a fire. And oh gosh, I wish <laughs> we'd had that right. Now it's online forever, right? So your whole family can can deal with it. But um, 
but yeah, and and even with my dad, you know, he was, uh, you know, he was he was of the generation where you know he wasn't the world's most expressive guy, right? And he did a lot of record keeping. He was a pretty organized guy, but even even still, you know, this past weekend, my siblings and I were going through some of his stuff, and we were just like, well, I don't know, we we don't we don't know what half of this stuff is, right? And clearly, he had it in a place where he valued it, and we're just like, we're not sure. You know, we don't know if we can throw this out or not because we have like, a good example. There was a hunk of wood there. And I was like, oh, OK, well, I guess this is something that we probably don't need. Right. And then uh, one of my brothers looked at it. There was like a little tiny engraving on it. It's part of the USS Constitution, you know, the <laughs> oldest uh, active uh, boat in the Navy, yeah. which is based in Boston. Careful. My dad lives north of there. Yeah, so be careful what you're throwing out. Yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah. And it's like, oh my God, you know, like we got to be super careful here, right? Yeah. So, you know, to your point, like there's just a lot of um uh I mean, we're defined by the stories of our family. And if those don't get passed down, we're all we're all diminished for it. Um, but just back to the 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 honor party for a second. I mean, I actually did this, I've been thinking about this for years. So when my wife turned 50, I did uh basically put a a, a request out to all of you know her close family and friends to just get on their phone for a minute, right? And just record a short video of them saying whatever they wanted to say about her. And I, I strung them all together in a nice video for her. And it was, I think, one of the most personal gifts she's ever gotten in her life, right? And uh, and again, anyways, I just think it's a, I think it's a fantastic see, idea. See, see, Adam, right there is a business that you and I can start. We'll just, we'll, we'll, we can launch this honor party company. You know, I mean, I, I, I honestly think so. Like, I don't know why it's not like a, a national holiday, if you will, right? I, I, you know, in other words, you know, just like, like a like a a, a bat mitzvah or a quinceanera or whatever, right? It's this that one point in your life where you get to hear all the nice things about you while you're still on this earth, right? Okay, all right, folks, look, if you're watching, this is Lance's and my idea. Don't steal it. Exactly, that's right. So you know, you get one day where everybody tells you how much they love you, and then oh wait, that's supposed to be your birthday. <laughs> So. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Um, all right, well, look, la last part on this topic, and then we'll then we'll close things up. Um, you know, as I mentioned, my dad wasn't the world's most talkative guy. Um, and later in life, uh, his hearing was going, you know, he had hearing aids. And, and you know, hearing losses, it's, it's, it's that's a rough condition, because um, it just... It, it just distances you from the world, right? You just, you can be around people, but you don't really feel like you're with them because you're not picking up on everything that, that folks are saying. Um, so anyways, it just made him even less communicative. Um, and, you know, there were, you know, I, th I, I think there were, there were elements that were left unsaid, you know, in our relationship. And I, I harbored, I think, a pretty unrealistic fantasy but that is, I, I thought that as he got older and sort of saw the end coming, um, maybe that might crack open the opportunity to sort of have some of these discussions. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, his his end came much swifter than he or anybody else thought. So it didn't get that chance. So the point being is, you know, especially with those in your life, you know, who are older and, and, and near the end, you know, don't wait for that magical moment uh, to to express the important things because you you very well may not get it in fact you know human nature being what it is you probably won't get it unless you force the the opening so um you know if there's if there's important things that you want those who are important to you to know yeah as awkward as it might be get a little uncomfortable but you know pick up the phone and have those conversations yep absolutely All and right. again it goes back to the joy of christmas which is make those reconciliations if you need to do that this is the time of year to do it yeah. And, you know, let's, I've, I've been talking a lot about what we've been talking about here. Um, I keep coming back to that stoic uh, philosophy of the obstacle is the way, um, which is, uh, it, it, it is almost like a superpower. If, if, if you get comfortable being uncomfortable with just tackling that thing that is standing in your way that you so desperately want to avoid, run away from, um, you know, uh, somehow just pray it magically disappears. Um, it, it it never does, and uh, if you if you just tackle it head on, yeah, it's super uncomfortable in the moment, but it is by far the most effective way to actually achieve forward constructive progress. And I've been doing a lot of that recently, and um, you know, I, I don't know if I'd say it gets easier as time goes on. Oh, it's always still it awkward. <laughs> it's never easy. It's never easy, but it is amazing how effective 
It is. And if uh, if I can give anybody watching here a little bit of inspiration, it's that if you've got, you know, a chronic problem um, that's been festering, you know, rather than just continuing to let it do so, just just put your hand on it and, and see what you can do. So to your point there about reparations, right? We all have relationships that aren't going exactly the way that we would like. And maybe we've got some uh, some culpability and in, in, in how that relationship has gone off track. Um you know, instead of instead of just lamenting it, you know, make those reparations, reach yeah. out, say, hey, look, I want things to be better. What's it going to take to make things right and start the new year afresh? Exactly right. So, you know, again, uh, you know, the, if you really want to make yourself feel better, just go outside and it doesn't matter who it is. Walk up to them, shake their hand, look them in the eye and, and wish them a Merry Christmas. And I have never done that. And the person failed to smile back and say, thank you, Merry Christmas, something back. It doesn't matter. It's, it's not the words. It's just the gesture because people have a, people have a need for connection. And in today's society, because of cell phones and everything else, we're losing that connection with other human beings. So if you really want to spread the joy of Christmas, shake somebody's hand and wish them a Merry Christmas. And you, you will feel so much better about yourself after doing that. This is a larger topic, so we'll we'll maybe delve more deeply into it in the future. Um, uh, I talked with Michael last week about Sebastian Younger's book Tribe, which really goes into kind of you know the science of of how humans are social animals and and we're wired for community and connection and all that stuff. But um, uh, you know, we're so starved for for meaningful connection in in today's day and age, which is so funny. Right, because we're such a prosperous society, and, and and for whatever reason, you know, it's it's become kind of the the badge of success of of not needing people, right? Yeah. Getting the big house on the hill, separate from everybody else, right? And of course, our our digital devices have have, despite having social media on them, have made us more physically disconnected from other people than ever. But what's so interesting is is, uh, you know, to your point there about just going up and talking to people, like. Uh, it's something that it, it's something that that most people feel a lot of anxiety around, right? Like, oh my gosh, if 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 I was to go be intrusive and you know, knock on someone's door or approach somebody, I'm 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 invading their space and uh, maybe they're not going to respond well or whatever, right? But what's in, so interesting is nine times out of ten, you know, all people are looking for is for somebody just to open the door for them a little bit to be able to have that connection. Right. So if, if you reach out and say, hey, I just want to have some sort of meaningful, you know, interaction here with you. Most people light up like a Christmas tree. I mean, literally, they're just like, you know, oh, my God, I, I, we, we, we can we, we can have this conversation. We can actually be two real people like, thank you. Right. Yeah, I, I talked. I'll try to make this really quick, but I. I um, uh, I used to talk an awful lot about this topic at, at a previous company that I ran um, and I wrote this one piece about the power of one and. Um, just the difference that one person can make in building community. And, and a personal anecdote that I slipped in there was um, when I used to live in, in the place I lived in before I moved up to where I live now, we lived in a little cul-de-sac, um, you know, typical Silicon Valley cul-de-sac. And same deal where like houses were all, you know, crunched and tight together. And I maybe knew my neighbor's first name, but I couldn't really tell you what he did for a living, right? You know, it was kind of like a wave hello relationship with everybody on the street. And, uh, and what happened was, is I started putting in um, a raised garden bed in the front of my yard. And one of my neighbors just sort of walked over and said, hey, what are you doing? And I said, oh, well, it's probably the first time I talked to him. And I said, well, I'm, I'm going to try to learn how to garden. He said, oh, hey, I'm, I'm actually a pretty accomplished gardener. You want to come into my backyard and let me show you what I put together? And so he did. And he toured me around. And he said, look, if you need any help, you know, I'm here to give you pointers. I was like, great, that's fantastic. And so later on in the summer, when our gardens were actually producing stuff. We said, hey, you know what? We should have like a little potluck where we can bring the stuff that we've been growing in our gardens. So we pulled uh, some tables and chairs and a grill out into the, the cul-de-sac. And as people were driving home from work, they were like, hey, what are you guys up to? And we're like, hey, we're having a potluck, you know, come on by. And everybody just brought a little, you know, whatever they had at home. And all of a sudden these like 10 households that had barely talked to one another, we're all of a sudden having this great social experience. We ended up having it every Sunday night, all summer for multiple years. 
Um, and it was just because, you know, of cracking that door open initially just a little bit at the beginning, but basically everybody just wanted the permission to be able to step into it. Right. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's, it's just funny. I tell people, this all the time, it's like, you know, I've got 300,000 friends online and I don't know any of them. So, yeah. yeah. You know, the, the, and this is this is the problem with social media. It's like we have all these friends and we don't have any connection with anybody. And, you know, and now we're so afraid to have a connection. Right. You're so afraid if you talk to somebody, are they going to be offended or, you know, whatever it is. You know, we just really keep driving that wedge deeper and deeper and deeper between the ability of, of having just any type of normal relationship with somebody. So it is completely understandable why people are afraid you know, to, to make the advance. But again, this is where you've got to be willing to be uncomfortable. And hey, you know what? You may meet the one asshole that you say Merry Christmas to. And he's like, you know, bah, bah humbug, right? He's the Grinch, you know. Those guys, those people live out there. And you may run across one, but don't let that deter you because for every one of those, you're going to have a hundred people that, you know, want that connection. They want you to say hello. Yeah. And, you know, we'll, we'll end up here um, so folks can get on with their own holidays. But th there is a lot of wisdom in this, you know, being uncomfortable and not just in, as an investor, but but in life. Right. You know, as we talk about social connections and stuff like people are messy. Right. You're never going to find somebody who perfectly aligns with every one of your beliefs and values. Right. People are just complex, complicated people. Right. And the 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 the, the skill is to find the good in them and the ability to coexist with people who have all these different sorts of ideas and preferences, whatever, right? And we we have this so interesting. We 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 have this kind of dominant social custom now that is is purportedly based on tolerance and inclusiveness, but it is so intolerant, right? You know, if 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 you if you aren't towing up behind whatever that day's conventional thinking is on topic X, you're totally ostracized, and that's just. That is the opposite of resilience. That is just a, a brittle, uh, you know, toxic uh, way to conduct, you know, any type of social relationship. So anyways, you know, part of this is us just realizing that, you know what, like the world is freaking messy and it's fine. I can, I can, I can still have a lot of respect and love for my neighbor or my friend who maybe has a different political persuasion than me, right? Or, um, you know, a different view of the markets or roots for the sports team I hate or, you know, whatever. Right. Oh, no, um, no, no, don't, don't go that far. <laughs> so, don't go that far. <laughs> sports, uh, are, sports are sacred. <laughs> don't be messing with the sports. <laughs> All right. Well, anyways, look, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up there, but um, good talking Lance um, in the spirit of, of the holidays and everything. Thank you for, um, you know, laying it on the field with me all year here, um, both on Thoughtful Money and on my precursor to this channel. Um, very much appreciate everything that you and the whole team there at Real Investment Advisors do. Um, have just nothing but a, a ton of excitement and optimism for what 2024 holds together for uh, your firm, for Thoughtful Money, for what we're going to be able to do together, hopefully what we can create for our audience here. Um, so yeah, from the bottom of my heart, buddy, thank you. Yeah, my my pleasure too. And by the way, I um I I totally forgot we needed to do this at the first of the uh, of the clip today. We need to remind everybody go by the website goinvestmentadvice.com and if you want to come see Adam in Houston January the 27th we have Greg Valliere uh coming to do a keynote speech on investing in the presidential election next year. Adam's going to be there. I'm going to be there Michael Leibowitz. We're going to talk about markets, money, investing in a presidential election year, what it all means, what to expect. We we'll have a Q&A panel. We're going to feed you lunch and breakfast. It will not be videoed. We have copyright issues with our keynote speaker, so it won't be, uh, won't be a video. So you've got to come to Houston, come see it. But tickets are online uh, for sale right now at realinvestmentadvice.com. But we, okay. we, we need to make sure to bring this up uh, next Saturday. Okay, we absolutely will. And if folks go to realinvestmentadvice.com, is it pretty easy to find out where this link yeah. is? Banner right on top of the page. Can't miss it. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to that um, for a whole variety of reasons, but that should be a great event. And uh, hopefully I'll be over this awful yeah. crunk by then. <laughs> you got 27 days. Hopefully you can get there. <laughs> hopefully. Yeah. All right. Well, look, folks, in wrapping up here, um, if you've enjoyed uh, today's weekly market recap at Lance, but have enjoyed all the ones we've had earlier this year, um, please let us know by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. 
And just a reminder, folks, too, that I have uh, resumed my practice of creating my Adams notes um, for the interviews that I do on this channel. These are my cliff notes, summaries, takeaways uh, of what I took away from, from each of the uh, major interviews that I do on this channel. Um, if you want to get those, just go to my Substack, which is adamtaggart.substack.com. There's a lot of information that I publish every week for free on there. Although if you want the notes, uh, those are available to premium subscribers only. And just a quick reminder, the premium price super low. It's like eight bucks a month right now. It is going up at the end of the month. So if you are thinking of subscribing, I'd highly recommend you do it now because then you'll be grandfathered in at that low uh, $8 a month price. And um, as long as you remain subscribed, Substack tells me that that's what your price will stay at. So you stay subscribed for 10 years, you're going to get that low eight bucks a month forever. So anyways, uh, if, if you're thinking about it, uh, go do that because we are now very quickly getting to the end of the year. Um, all right, Lance, look, I'll let you have the last word, buddy. Anything else you want to say to folks as we part? Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. And we'll see you next year. All right. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching and happy holidays. Merry Christmas, happy Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, whatever. Enjoy your holiday time with your family. Take care, everyone.